I know things are running a little long this week. Gauss's law. There's various cases and geometry that needs to be shown. And here's one last example, also of spherical symmetry. The only difference here is we have non-conducting instead of conducting shell, so we can no longer have those big swaths of space where things are equal to zero. And I will go through this fairly quickly because there's only one real extra point to talk about, and that's what happens given the non-conducting part, how you include parts of a cylinder in your in terms of your charge enclosed. And that's all there is to it. Uh, we've kind of seen the same thing when we did the uniformly charged cylinder. So let's get to it. I'm going to do this question backwards, actually, because I'm going to start from the inside outwards. I just find that more intuitive for me. So that's R is less than A1. So first we do E, R is less than A1, which is inside the small shell. So again, spherical geometry. Spherical Gaussian surface, no surprise there. No matter how the surface, you can see that it encloses how much charge? No charge. So therefore, flux enclosed equals zero, and therefore E has to be equal to zero. Then we move on to D, which is here. I guess this is what you might call inside the shell. Again, inside the substance of the shell maybe so there we would take just part of the shell because again we're interested in my enclosed charge so the part that is enclosed if i can draw it here exaggeratedly and there's my gaussian surface i just want that part so the charge enclosed is equal to rho times the volume enclosed and how do you find the volume of a shell like that? Well, that's going to be the the bigger sphere volume, which is 4 over 3 pi cube. Okay, so the R is my R itself. But you subtract away the inner R, which is the inner sphere. And that is that like that. This is, of course, row 1. And we've seen this enough to know how the other side looks like. The other side ends up being the electric field multiplied by the overall surface area of the sphere. So we have E is equal to 4 pi r squared. It's equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. So then not wasting so much time here equals that. Okay, moving on. Part C is this point that I actually want, which is between the two shells. So in this case, we would enclose, and the enclosed charge is everything in the inside shell. So again, we won't be dependent on R necessarily because the volume stops at B1. So charge enclosed in this case is equal to 4 over 3 pi times rho 1 of the outer spherical radius minus the inner spherical volume and you get that and the same things cancel out again with the spherical geometry and stuff we end up with a expression very similar to before except instead of talking about using r up here we just have b1 because your outer volume stops at b1 doesn't keep following your r all the way out here and b we're now inside that sphere so we have to include the part of the sphere that's inside your Gaussian surface. So your Q enclosed is both what we had for part C and some part of the charge of the outside. In this case, the outer sphere is R and the inner sphere is A2, the radius of it. Same kind of canceling applies. And then for part A, we include everything of the outer sphere as well. So that should be not very surprising that we'll replace what we had as R with B2. And there you go. Uh, thank you for sticking with us all this time. The two main points here is to learn how to include parts of a spherical shell in terms of taking the outer 
sphere volume minus the inner sphere volume. And also, notice that at the inside, at the inner, inner, inner part, as long as you have no charge enclosed, it doesn't matter what's happening around the outside. Because of that spherical symmetry, the only possible solution is that there's no electric field anywhere where you cannot enclose a charge.